Um, obviously in the works, what, the last 48 hours, 72 hours? I don't know. Um, actually, much longer than that. But, um, you know, one of the difficulties, obviously, with, with trading a guy like Cole Hamels is what he's meant to our organization over the years. Um, you know, when we have players that are homegrown, guys that we, that we drafted, uh, it was a tremendous draft. Uh, we developed him. He developed himself. Uh, he made the, made himself the player that he was uh, for our organization. Um, there is nothing at all easy about any of these uh, decisions and trades. Uh, Jimmy Rollins, um, Cole Hamels, um, you know, there's, they're difficult because these are uh, iconic players for our organization. But uh, this is exactly what we uh, set out. These are the types of things that we set out to do when we went into uh, – uh, this transition in the off season, and um, we got a, a a very good package of players that I think will help uh, propel this organization forward in the future. Jimmy, we'll start with you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks. How big of a risk is Alfaro? What do you know about the the, the condition of uh, of his ankle? What was the exact injury in the surgery, and uh, is he a catcher long term? Is he a first baseman long term? What what type of a key was he to this deal? Uh, very important. I mean, every single one of the players were important. Um, you know, there's uh, you know you try to value and uh, evaluate uh, the players. Uh, clearly, when you're talking about a premium position type player, someone who can be a very good offensive player who can who can uh, work behind the plate, um, that's that's a pretty key element. Uh, he and uh, and Williams clearly on the offensive side of the uh, of the deal um, were very very important to us. Um, we view them as premium prospects. Now, the risk is the biggest risk really is not so much in the uh, in the injury, but in how these guys will continue to develop and what the what they might be able to do here in Philadelphia. That's the risk because they're because they're prospects. But we think you know. We think they're going to be guys who are going to impact our club and uh, hopefully in the near future. Will he play this the remainder of this minor league season, Alfaro? He is on his way to um, Philadelphia. We are going to have our doctors examine him, uh, put our own hands on him. Um, he's likely to go back to Clearwater. We'll, we'll we'll set out kind of a plan. We know the information, have all the information from the Texas folks um, about his injury. Um, we felt comfortable that he's going to be fine. One of the things that is a, of risk is because it's an ankle, and he plays that position um, where they say he's dorsiflexed all the time um, with his with his with his ankle. Um, but we don't think it's going to be a long term issue because it was an acute injury. I think he was actually he was leading off second base, and I think he just twisted it in a weird way. Um, I think he damaged like a ligament sheath. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know how, all the ins and outs of it, other than. Um, we do know a lot about uh, the injury, our doctors, and, and we felt comfortable enough um, to go ahead and move forward without you know, feeling that's going to be a long-term issue for him as a catcher. We did get him as a catcher. The, uh, the beauty of Alfaro is that you know, this guy can swing the bat. is so athletic that he could play another position if the catching thing doesn't work out. But he's made great strides over the last um, uh, few years, uh, particularly with his uh, work behind the plate. And, you know, we hope that he can impact us, obviously, behind the plate. Ryan, how difficult uh, was the money factor in this whole thing? When I mean, you look at it, you guys are taking on what would seem to be a, a bad contract in addition, throwing a significant amount of money back Texas's way to – Especially when you consider Hamels and the fact that his contract seems reasonable, especially considering the guys that are going to be on the free agent market, it seems like Hamels' contract is a team-friendly one. It's a great question. I mean, listen, in all these deals, the, the, the money's an issue. I mean, this is big money we're talking about. There's complications. There's um, there's years of control. There's um, you know we have to factor in um, you know what the now nowadays what the you know surplus value of of the talent that we're getting back and what they will mean not just short term but long to more long term term for us as, uh, as far as econo the econ economics piece of it. Um, you know, we're in a world where I think teams are buying talent. This is one of the ways that we can use our economic muscle to buy talent. And I think in, that, in a lot of ways, that's that's what we did. And um, But we bought talent with talent, and we bought talent with, with uh, 
with with dollars and cents as well. Um, you know, these are things that uh, have to get approved by our ownership group that uh, Pat has to approve, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, these are these are not these are not simple. These are not easy. But um, you know, based on uh, all the information that we had with the package that we um, you know that we ended up getting, I think uh, we used our money wisely here. Todd. Ruben. Hi. Hi, Todd. <laughs> Hi. Uh, look at Jake Thompson's numbers. Uh, he was the top starting pitching prospect in the Rangers system. I believe he was with the Tigers' system. And, you know, the numbers don't look great, but, you know, I know oftentimes there's a player maybe working on a new pitch or whatever. Can you kind of talk about how you see him uh, projecting and uh, as a, you know, down-the-road type of guy? Yeah, I mean, he could be anywhere from the middle of the rotation to the top of the rotation to the bottom of the rotation. We just don't know. He's still young enough. He's a you know, fairly young player still um, who is pitching in double-A. We've got a very good arm, um, got good, very good stuff. Um, somebody that was important to us as well in, on the pitching side of this. Um, you know, when we get, when we make these kind of deals, uh, clearly pitching was, I mean, we talked about the catching and the offense, but pitching was also pretty pretty important, very important to us because we just don't have enough depth at the upper, upper levels. We, we, we started this process doing it in the off season. We added some more with Ikoff and Asher and uh, obviously Thompson. They're all upper level guys. They're going to pitch for us in the big leagues at some time, at some point. We just don't know how high a little, a lot of it depends on how they continue to develop and whether they can develop once they're here in the big leagues. Um, as far as the numbers are concerned, I think it's a, you know, when we analyze these players, it's not just the numbers. Uh, it's not just the scouting. Um, it's a combination of those things. And uh, based on, you know, all the peripherals and the analytics, as well as, you know, you know putting those together with, with our scouting reports, we felt like these were the right guys to go target. Well, uh, Harrison, I guess, was part of it for the, for money purposes. Is he healthy, and how does he fit into this whole thing? We're going to find out. He's good flying in today, and he's going to be checked out by our medical people. Um, our our latest understanding is that uh, after coming out of the game, his last start, that uh, he was a little stiff and uh, a little sore. Um, but. Uh, but we'll see. Our, our medical people will give us a little bit more information before the game today. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to start in his turn, and I'll find out from our from our medical people here within the next couple of hours. Do you see more as just a money type of exchange? Like, do you see him actually having a few to look at? He's one of those guys that if he's healthy enough and can come bounce back to be um, close to where he was before, um, you know, it's a good risk because he can create some value for us. Um, as far as you know, being able to maybe uh, you know help stabilize you know our, our rotation uh, down the road, um, but there's a lot of different factors. He was he was one of those factors and adding, adding him to the to the piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, bottom line is if uh, if he can bounce back and be um, you know be a solid piece for us, that'd be great. And uh, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. But I'll know more about. Uh, his overall um, medical situation once our doctors and sat examine him today. Howard. Ruben, uh, knowing the people in this town, they want to know if you made the deal, Pat Gillick made the deal, or Andy McPhail made the deal, and why did it take so long? I know you mentioned some of the things with, yeah. with money, but obviously you know what people are thinking out there. As far as taking so long, I've been working with J.D. Uh, John Daniels on this deal probably for six or seven or eight months. Um, it's something that we've discussed um, for a very long time. We felt with the depth of talent that they have in their system, they were the right match for us, I think. Um, as far as doing the deals, it was no different from uh, how I've been operating since I took over in the, at the end of 2008. Um, I had Pat Gillick in the, in the room with me, and I had uh, Andy McPhail in the room with me, but I was the, I'm the GM, and you know we made the deals. Um, uh, clearly, the process by which we do these deals is uh, a, kind of an all-encompassing process. Uh, I'm the point guy, um, and uh, I guess the talking head, whatever you want to call me. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, um, this is no this is no different from doing a uh, you know a deal for Cliff Lee or or uh, or anyone else. I mean, you said it was a good deal. Obviously, you felt it was. 
those guys were on board with it. Oh, yeah, listen, there was a lot of uh, discussion back and forth as to which pieces were right for us. You know, I mean, as you can imagine, when you talk about eight players uh, of this magnitude, um, there's going to be a lot of dialogue. That's why it takes so long. Uh, that's why some of the complications after all the rumors popped that the deal was done. Um, there's so many different factors that, and things that have to happen to, uh, to make these deals in this day and age. It's not like, listen... We'll take A and B, and we'll flip them, and we'll be good. It just doesn't work like that anymore. There's approvals. There's all types of, uh, you know, paperwork and things to be done. So that's that's you know part of why it's it took so long. Kev, Ruben, what was what was the difference in this market compared to last year for Hamels? Was it a simple matter of the salaries down, or the urgency from you guys to get a deal done at this point? I think actually um, him pitching again and having the kind of success and being healthy again um, and maybe his, his contract not being quite as long, I think it was a much more fruitful um, market for us. Uh, there, there were no shortage of suitors here. Um, and uh, we just felt like this was uh, under the circumstances and with – and we were – as I said, we we were not forced. We, were, we had no mandate. Um we just felt uh, collectively as a group that this is the right thing for us to do as a, in our organization. And um, and had we not gotten a deal that was commensurate to what we thought was the right thing to do to move our organization forward, we wouldn't have done it. Um, but we were very happy with, with the return. Um, you know, what we get in this return is still, you know, that's an unknown. Who, who, who knows what's going to happen with these guys? But we have, we believe... Um, that the level of talent that we received in this deal was uh, exactly uh, what we were looking for. We were looking for depth, and we were looking for quality, and we got both. Jimmy? R- were you disappointed that he thumbs down on Houston, and did they offer a better package? Uh, listen, Cole earned the right through the contract to decide wherever he wanted to go. And um, and were there other opportunities to... to um, to get more clubs involved and were others aggressive? Yes, they were. There were some clubs that were aggressive. Uh, uh, and Could we have gotten better deals? I don't know that. Um, but uh, but we did travel down a path even with some some clubs that um, um, that he didn't have on his on his on his list. But he has every right to and and that's an important piece of this. He had every right to to, to go where he wanted to as. Uh, as dictated by his contract. He had a limited no-trade clause. Um, the fact of the matter is, Texas's pieces, their depth, um, the way we lined up really worked very, very well for us. And, uh, that you know, th- those are th- that's the best deal that we felt we, we could make. Did you pursue guys like Gallo and Mazzara, and were you told, like, they were not available? Or? Uh, the answer to that is probably yes. Um, you know, we... We talked about a variety of different uh, combinations. Um, the beauty of that organization is that they have a lot of depth. And uh, could we have continued to hold out for those types of players? Maybe. But would we have gotten the same le- level of depth um, and quality? I, don't, I do not believe so. And so um, we had a lot of names that, that were tossed around. They have a ton of, uh, of talent. And, uh, I mean, uh, we haggled and haggled and haggled. And, and we got to the point where um, I think, you know, both sides are very, very comfortable with the with the deal that was made, and and in fact, I, I, and I'll give a quick shout out to John Daniels on this because, you know, these deals are not easy, and um, and over time you 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 develop a relationship with some of the guys that you do some of these deals with. Uh, he was extraordinarily professional. Um, we didn't have you know there are times when uh, things can get a little bit sticky at times, and uh, I think this overall negotiation went very very well with JD. Tell us where uh, Williams and um, uh, and Thompson will go. Yeah, right now we have Williams headed to Double uh, A right now, and and Thompson as well. I think that Reading Club is going to be pretty exciting to watch. Um, yeah, I think uh, we talked last night. Um, Williams probably will not get in a lineup probably till Monday or Tuesday. I think we have an off day there on Monday, um, probably Tuesday. Um, and then Thompson, uh, frankly, I think he is scheduled to be able to throw either Sunday, Saturday, or Sunday, but I'm not positive. Pat. Uh, we'll get them right. We'll try to get them right into, into the program. Pat. 
Ruben, you mentioned that you had no problem with waiting this thing out until the off season, but do you think that was feasible knowing that we'd sort of reached a fever pitch with this and what the market was saying to you as far as starting pitching was concerned? Um, you know, it's hard to predict, you know, uh, where the market was going to be next this this next off season. I think that this was uh, the time when, you know, we felt that, uh, you know, we maximized our leverage uh, with, with, with him. And uh, the reality of it is there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of players out there in the free agent market, and teams are going to are, are much more willing. I will tell you this: <laughs> in this day and age, they are much more willing to dole out money than they are prospects. And so, the value of the prospect has increased dramatically. I've had to make a personal adjustment on that, um, and, and to understand that a little bit better and, and make the adjustment there. Um, and I think we did that with this deal, but. Um, you know, when you start flooding the market with starting pitching, which is a very strong possibility this off season, uh, it, it could make the uh, landscape a little bit more difficult for you to try to reach your goals when you're talking about players like this. Mike, uh, Ruben, over here. Uh, you're listening to the Ruben Amaro Jr. press conference, courtesy of Comcast Sportsnet, right here on 97.3 ESPN FM. After the age of 31, did, did those fa- did that play any factor in your thinking? Okay, we should. <laughs> You know, we, we should move him now before we get potentially in a similar situation. We took a very um, – this may not sound right because it's coming from my mouth, but we took a, took a pretty um, a- analytical approach as far as what we saw what we saw with these guys and where the trends might be. Um, naturally, as players get older, their, their ability to, um, to function at the same level can dip. Uh, Cole has been extraordinarily healthy and extraordinarily effective for a long, long time at the major league level. He's thrown a lot of pitches. Doesn't mean that he's going to get worse, but um, you know you have to kind of factor some of those things in. Once he's 31 years old and start working his way uh, north of that, um, that can be a factor. I happen to think that he's going to continue to be a very, very good major league pitcher, top of the rotation pitcher for several years. Because he has the ability to change speeds, he doesn't have to rely on his velocity as much. He's, you know, um, when his breaking ball is right, um, he has three, you know, double plus pitches. So, um, I think that if his velocity goes, for instance, a guy like Papelbon, whose velocity is dipped now, but he has the ability to get people out because of his deception and other reasons, I think that Cole, even if he does lose some velocity, is going to be effective. But we have to take that into account as well. Um, and taking into account what might happen risk-wise as far as his overall health. He's been a picture of health, and uh, we've been fortunate to be able to... I mean, he's had some glitches here and there, but um, but he's uh, for, for a guy who's been this kind of, had this kind of workload, what, uh, you know, 30 starts in, what, five or six straight years or whatever it is, he's, he's been pretty extraordinary. 